When that April, with his surest sorter, the drucht of March hath person to the rota, and bathed every vine in such liqueur of which vertu engendered is the floor, when Zephyrus ache with his sweet a breath, in spirit hath in every halt and hath the tender croppers, and the younger sunna hath in the ram his halva coursey runna, and small a fool's mac and melodia that slapen all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh him nature in here courages, than long and fall to go on pilgrimages, and palmers for to saken stronger stronders to ferne halwes, cooth in sundry londers. And specially from every shearer's ender of England to Canterbury thy wender, the holy blissful martyr for to seke that him hath holpen when that thy were seke. Befill that in that saison on a day, in soothwork at the tabard as he lay, ready to wenden on me pilgrimage to Canterbury with full devout courage, at nicht was come into that hostelry well nine and twenty in a compagnie of sundry folk, be aventure falla in fellowship, and pilgrims were they alle, the toward Canterbury Walton reader. The chambers and the stablers were in reader, and well we were nazed, at the best. And shortly, when the sunna was to rest, so had he spoken with him every chorn, that he was of here fellowship anon, and made a forward early for to reza, to talk or why, there as he would a visa. My true love hath my heart, and I have his, by just exchange one for another given. I hold his dear, and mine he cannot miss. There never was a better bargain driven. My true love hath my heart, and I have his. His heart in me keeps him and me in one. My heart in him, his thoughts and senses guides. He loves my heart, for once it was his own. I cherish his, because in me it bides. My true love hath my heart, and I have his. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me. And I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows, 
and when we meet at any time again, be it not seen in either of our brows that we one jot of former love retain. Now, at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, when faith is kneeling by his bed of death, and innocence is closing up his eyes. Now, if thou wouldst, when all have given him over, from death to life, thou mightst him yet recover. All the flowers of the spring meet to perfume our burying. These have but their growing prime, and man does flourish but his time. Survey our progress from our birth. We are set, we grow, we turn to earth. Courts adieu and all delights, all bewitching appetites, sweetest breath and clearest eye, like perfumes go out and die, and consequently this is done as shadows wait upon the sun. Vain the ambition of kings, who seek by trophies and dead things to leave a living name behind, and weave but nets to catch the wind. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea, the ploughman homeward plods his weary way, and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds, save that from yonder ivy-mantled tower the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath those rugged elms, that yew tree shade, where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap, each in his narrow cell for ever laid, the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. Approach and read, for thou canst read the lay, graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn. Here rests his head upon the lap of earth, a youth to fortune and to fame unknown. Fair science frowned not on his humble birth, and melancholy marked him for her own. Large was his bounty, and his soul sincere. Heaven did a recompense as largely send. He gave to misery all he had, a tear. He gained from heaven "'Twas all he wished, a friend. "'No father seek his merits to disclose "'or draw his frailties from their dread abode. "'There they alike in trembling hope repose, "'the bosom of his father and his God. "'O oh, Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock i had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leafy wards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease, Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, 
dance and Provencal song and sunburned mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known. The weariness, the fever, and the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee, tender is the night, and happily the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild. White hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose full of dewy wine, the murmurous horn to flies on summer eves. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Had you, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do deceiving elf. Had you, had you, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old. Or let me die. The child is father of the man. 
and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright, for the sword outwears its sheath and the soul wears out the breast and the heart must pause to breathe and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Oh, to be in England now that April's there and whoever wakes in England sees some morning unaware that the lowest boughs and the brushwood sheaf round the elm tree bowl are in tiny leaf while the chaffinch sings on the orchard bough in England now. And after April when May follows and the white throat builds and all the swallows Hark, where my blossomed pear tree in the hedge leans to the field and scatters on the clover blossoms and dewdrops at the bent spray's edge. That's the wise thrush. He sings each song twice over, lest you should think he never could recapture the first fine, careless rapture. And though the fields look rough with hoary dew, all will be gay when noontide wakes anew the buttercups, the little children's dower far brighter than this gaudy melon flower. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright, and this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose the walrus said that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four. And thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax of cabbages and kings and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. 
But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but, cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick. The carpenter said nothing but, hmm, the butter's spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd, because they'd eaten every one. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre grey, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outlent. His crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead, in a full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt and small, in blast-beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around that I could think there trembled through his happy good-night air some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was unaware. What passing bells for those who die as cattle only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries for them from prayers or bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall. Their flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. And death shall have no dominion. Dead men naked, they shall be one with a man in the wind and the west moon. When their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone, they shall have stars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not. And death shall have no dominion. 
and death shall have no dominion under the windings of the sea they lying long shall not die windily twisting on racks when sinews give way strapped to a wheel yet they shall not break faith in their hands shall snap in two and the unicorn evils run them through split all ends up they shan't crack and death shall have no dominion and death shall have no dominion no more may gulls cry at their ears or waves break loud on the seashores where blue a flower may a flower no more lift its head to the blows of the rain though they be mad and dead as nails heads of the characters hammer through daisies break in the sun till the sun breaks down and death shall have no dominion. Now we must praise the ruler of heaven, the might of the Lord and his purpose of mind, the work of the glorious Father. For he, God eternal, established each wonder. He, holy creator, first fashioned the heavens as a roof for the children of earth. And then our guardian, the everlasting Lord, adorned this middle earth for men. Praise the almighty King of heaven. With how sad steps, O moon, thou climbst the skies, how silently, and with how wan a face. What? May it be that even in heavenly place that busy archer his sharp arrows tries? Sure, if that long with love acquainted eyes can judge of love, thou feelst a lover's case. I read it in thy looks, thy languished grace to me that feel the like thy state descries. Then even of fellowship, O moon, tell me, is constant love deemed there but want of wit? Are beauties there as proud as here they be? Do they above love to be loved, and yet those lovers scorn whom that love doth possess? Do they call virtue there ungratefulness? Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone and tame thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant's stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat. To thee the reed is as the oak. The scepter, learning, physic, must all follow this and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure, rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. All, all lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. No exorciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee. Quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure then from thee, much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go. Rest of their bones and souls' delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die.
When love with unconfined wings hovers within my gates, and my divine Althea brings to whisper at the grates, when I light tangled in her hair and fettered to her eye, the birds that wanton in the air know no such liberty. When flowing cups run swiftly round with no allaying Thames, our careless heads with roses bound, our hearts with loyal flames. When thirsty grief in wine we steep, when healths and draughts go free, fishes that tipple in the deep, no, no such liberty. When, like committed linnets, I with shriller throat shall sing the sweetness, mercy, majesty, and glories of my king. When I shall voice aloud how good he is, how great should be, enlarged winds that curl the flood, no, no such liberty. Stone walls do not a prison make nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for an hermitage. If I have freedom in my love, and in my soul am free, angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a-getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer, but being spent the worse and worst times still succeed the former. Then be not coy, but use your time, and why ye may go marry, for having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose, that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gang dry. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee weel, my only love, and fare thee weel a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, 
Who can thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both? In Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit, ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss. Though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade. Though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above, that leaves a heart high, sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O oh mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies? and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need. She walks in beauty, like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek, and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. The fountains mingle with the river, and the rivers with the ocean, the winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single. All things by a law divine in one spirit meet and mingle. Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss high heaven and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet work worth, if thou kiss not me?
Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. Nor waves the cypress in the palace walk, nor winks the gold fin in the porphyry font. The firefly wakens, waken thou with me. Now droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost, and like a ghost she glimmers on to me. Now lies the earth, all Danae, to the stars, and all thy heart lies open unto me. Now slides the silent meteor on, and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up, and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest thou, and slip into my bosom, and be lost in me. I took my heart in my hand, O oh my love, O oh my love. I said, let me fall or stand, let me live or die. But this once hear me speak, O oh my love, O oh my love. Yet a woman's words are weak, you should speak, not I. You took my heart in your hand with a friendly smile, with a critical eye you scanned, then set it down and said, it is still unripe, better wait a while. Wait while the skylarks pipe till the corn grows brown. As you set it down, it broke, broke. But I did not wince. I smiled at the speech you spoke, at your judgment that I heard. But I have not often smiled since then, nor questioned since nor cared for cornflowers wild, nor sung with the singing bird. I take my heart in my hand, O oh my God, O oh my God, my broken heart in my hand, thou hast seen, judge thou. My hope was written on sand, O oh my God, O oh my God, now let thy judgment stand, yea, judge me now. This contempt of a man, this marred one heedless day, this heart take thou to scan, both within and without. Refine with fire its gold, purge thou its dross away, yea, hold it in thy hold, whence none can pluck it out. I take my heart in my hand. I shall not die, but live. Before thy face I stand, I for thou callest such. All that I have I bring, all that I am I give. Smile thou, and I shall sing, but shall not question much. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is for ever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's, breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think, this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter learnt of friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. Today we have naming of parts. Yesterday we had daily cleaning, and tomorrow morning we shall have what to do after firing. But today, today we have naming of parts. Japonica glistens like coral in all of the neighboring gardens. And today we have naming of parts. This is the lower sling swivel, and this is the upper sling swivel, whose use you will see when you're given your slings. And this is the piling swivel, 
which in your case you have not got. The branches hold in the gardens their silent, eloquent gestures, which in our case we have not got. This is the safety catch, which is always released with an easy flick of the thumb. And please do not let me see anyone using his finger. You can do it quite easy if you have any strength in your thumb. The blossoms are fragile and motionless, never letting anyone see any of them using their finger. And this, you can see, is the bolt. The purpose of this is to open the breech, as you see. We can slide it rapidly backwards and forwards. We call this easing the spring. And rapidly, backwards and forwards, the early bees are assaulting and fumbling the flowers. They call it easing the spring. They call it easing the spring. It is perfectly easy if you have any strength in your thumb. Like the bolt and the breech and the cocking piece and the point of balance, which in our case we have not got. And the almond blossom silent in all of the gardens and the bees going backwards and forwards. For today we have naming of parts. But that was nothing to what things came out from the sea caves of Krikieth yonder. What were they? Mermaids? Dragons? Ghosts? Nothing at all of any things like that. What were they then? All sorts of queer things. Things never seen or heard or written about. Very strange, unwelsh, utterly peculiar things. Oh, solid enough they seemed to touch had anyone dared it. Marvellous creation, all various shapes and sizes and no sizes. All new, each perfectly unlike his neighbour, though all came moving slowly out together. Describe just one of them. I am unable. What were their colours? Mostly nameless colours. Colours you'd like to see. But one was puce, or perhaps more like crimson, but not purplish. Some had no colour. Tell me, had they legs? Not a leg nor a foot amongst them that I saw. But did these things come out in any order? What o'clock was it? What was the day of the week? Who else was present? How was the weather? I was coming to that. It was half past three on Easter Tuesday last. The sun was shining. The Harlech Silver Band played Marchog Yesi on 37 shimmering instruments, collecting for Carnarvon's Fever Hospital Fund. The populations of Pulheli, Krikieth, Port Madoc, Borf, Tremadoc, Penryn, Dydreith were all assembled. Krikieth's mayor addressed them first in good Welsh and then in fluent English, twisting his fingers in his chain of office, welcoming the things. They came out on the sand, not keeping time to the band, moving seaward silently at a snail's pace. But at last, the most odd, indescribable thing of all, which hardly one man there could see for wonder, did something, recognizably a something. Well, what? It made... A noise. A frightening noise? No, no. A musical noise? A noise of scuffling? No, but a very loud, respectable noise, like groaning to oneself on Sunday morning in chapel close before the second psalm. What did the mayor do? I was coming to that. I will arise and go now and go to Innes Free, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the vales of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core.
What is this life if, full of care, we have no time to stand and stare? No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can enrich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if, full of care, we have no time to stand and stare.